Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff. So come think with me. Today I have a, another special guest with me, Dr. Guillaume Bignon. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to hear a little bit about the pronunciation of this podcast <laughs> because I, I just butcher the name in all my intros. Uh, I do that for a reason. But uh, Dr. Guillaume Bignon is a French analytic philosopher and computer scientist, uh, uh, computer scientist who works in the financial industry in New York. He's an executive committee member of Associate, Association Axiom, a society of French-speaking Christian philosophers. He's a, a father, a husband. He's a lot of great stuff. And um, Dr. Bignon, thank, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, one of the things that everyone has to say about you is that you are a French analytic <laughs> philosopher, and and usually you know French Calvinist, and for whatever reason we love we love those two things together. Yes, well, thanks for having me. Uh, I think Paul Helm in the uh, I don't know if it was in the forward of my book or, or somewhere else had written once that uh, I was with my focus on argument and reasoning, I am somewhat of an unusual French philosopher, <laughs> which I thought was a very nice job to my fellow Frenchmen philosophers. Uh, but yeah, so we we brought you a whole lot of bad philosophy, and I'm trying mm. to clean up the mess, I guess. <laughs> well, thanks for that. I love that. Uh, even if your arguments weren't good, you know, everyone says this, but I'll say it too. The the French accent, you know, uh, covers uh, many sins there. All right, good. So I'll continue on sinning so that <laughs> grace may abound. That's right. That's right. Uh, I think one thing that gets me excited, actually, that you're a French philosopher uh, and a Calvinist is that, you know, Calvin was a uh, a French theologian and, and uh, you know, Paul Helm actually wrote a whole two books about uh, two or three about how he is a philosopher or his philosophy, at least. So it's nice to to see that, but then you still embody the French spirit. The uh, uh, Calvin was from Picard. I don't I don't know if Picard's even a place anymore in France. I'm a American swine. Picardy, yeah, that would be a, a region. Yeah. But uh, don't ask me about geography. Uh, if we if we veer <laughs> off from too much philosophy into geography, even from my own uh, uh, motherland, uh, will mm. uh, fail you very quickly. So. <laughs> right. We'll stick to it then. So uh, for those watching on the the background here, you can't really see, but it's. It's the cover of uh, Guillaume's book, Excusing Sinners and Blaming God, a Calvinist assessment of determinism, moral, moral responsibility, and divine involvement in evil. And these are all things that I I love. You know, I, I'm not excited about uh, having to think through divine involvement in evil, but it's something that we have to deal with. And it's really uh, exciting to see someone like him working in this field. And so I picked this book out uh, right when it came out, and it's influenced my thought a ton. So I'm very excited to have uh, Guillaume. Can I call you Guillaume? Is Dr. Bignon? It's totally up to you. Guillaume sounds great. And I have to <laughs> say, you did a much better job at pronouncing my full name than the title of your own podcast. So that's quite impressive. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. But it's, it's really not pensées in French. It's going to be pensées. So les pensées yeah. de Pascal, right? Okay. I'm going to need that again. So so I, I always heard uh, passé, but but there sounds like an N in there. Can you do it? Yeah. So the E-N sound is really a diphthong. So it's only one combined sound and it's okay. en. So it's pensées. Pensée. Pensée. Okay. Yes, pensée. <laughs> but as far as my name, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, Guillaume, oh, thank you. We're, Guillaume will work just fine. So yeah, I've had a couple years to practice there. But um, so I, I'm so I was so tempted to go with you know, pensées, but uh, you know I'm I'm American. I don't speak French, so I feel like it'd be a little bit pretentious. So I'll just yes, stick with uh, the, the poor pronunciation. But you know, enough about my bad French. Um, to, there's a couple of things I wanted to focus on. I, I We could spend all night uh, talking about the arguments in this book, and you do such a great job. At the at the point where I read this, my logic wasn't uh, quite up to snuff. I was studying logic at the time, but I hadn't got far enough. So I had to put part... Uh, I had to, When I got to certain arguments, I had to put it down and go back to the logic book and make sure that I knew what you're talking about. And so that was actually an, uh, another big encouragement to me that you were taking it serious and you were being very rigorous with your arguments. So, so that was huge, but it also challenged me and made me uh, grow in my area of logic too. So that was great. All right. Praise God. I mean, I think that this is the way I also uh, grew my skills in this area is just by reading people doing it well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not something you really, I, I don't think I've 
benefited mostly from reading textbooks or on logic mm -hmm. or what have you but just seeing somebody engage in the discipline and doing it well mm -hmm. you just read and devour their words and I, I found myself to become fluent in that language and skill without really trying simply because it's just impressed on me so yeah if now I get to um, benefit others in that way that's very Definitely. exciting so yeah uh, just uh, a couple more biolog uh, biographical notes so you did your this book comes out of your PhD right this yes. is a Okay, and and you did your PhD under Paul Helm, that's right? Yeah, that's correct. Yes, at okay. the London School of Theology. So, can you just how how did you get connected with him uh, in the in the London School working on on this uh, topic? Uh, let's see. There was kind of a convoluted uh, series of uh, references, which worked out really well for me at the time. I, uh, I mean, I, I did my seminary study in uh, New York, and uh, my New Testament professor, uh, Dr. Shell Rood, had connected me with. Um, Peter Williams from a, a Tyndale House in Cambridge saying, mm -hmm. hey, maybe he will have good connections for a PhD in Europe. Uh, I, since I live in the US, I needed a, a PhD in Europe where I would not have the uh, classes and comprehensive exam and all of the stuff that the American PhDs require. Yeah. So he said, well, why don't you uh, speak with uh, Peter Williams in Europe? He might have some good references. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I think he connected me to uh, yeah, Daniel Hill at the University of Liverpool, but uh, there uh, he would have had, you know, I would have needed to actually relocate. But then uh, Daniel Hill, I think, just, um, recommended uh, London School of Theology, where Paul Helm was uh, supervising th uh, thesis, and so that's how I got connected. With mm. him. And that's awesome. I, I shared my project; he was interested, and so here we go. Oh, I love it. And so, and uh, to to connect it back to your work, so that whole process was determined by God before the foundation of the world, and yet you you chose to do that. Uh, you 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 weren't coerced. You weren't manipulated. And uh, then that brings not us that I, not that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> right. but, but yes, I, right. I presumably did that freely. Yeah. Well, so that that brings us to um, one of my favorite arguments to kind of wrestle through is the manipulation argument, uh, especially by by Dirk Paraboom, but uh, uh, Alfred Mealy has offered different arguments, uh, Robert Kane and uh, Catherine Rogers. Um, so I thought we could start there with with uh, manipulation arguments and then kind of uh, go go from there. So I have uh, I pulled the main thrust is what I'm calling it. Um, from your book and i'll just read that over and then we can we can start talking about it but the main thrust is if determinism is true uh then all human choices are manipulated if a person's choice is manipulated then that person cannot be morally responsible for it therefore if determinism is true then no person can be morally responsible for any of his choices which is to say determinism is incompatible with moral responsibility and so there we're, we're talking moral responsibility do you um, are you making a, a distinction between free will and moral responsibility? Uh, yes, I am making a distinction, uh, but uh, simply because the, I, I see uh, free will as an ingredient of moral responsibility. So mm. free, free will typically is going to be defined as the control condition for moral responsibility. So that uh, free will is simply to say of somebody that he has free will and that he's using his free will on any given choice is that he has the control that's appropriate uh, for him to be suitable for praise or blame. Mm. So that is that he's, he's enough in control of what he's doing that he cannot be excused for what he's doing, or uh, that he can can suitably be praised or blamed. He, he is morally responsible. That requires a degree of control. Now, control is not the only thing that is required for moral responsibility. Uh, typically, we'll think of uh, epistemic conditions as well. There are some things that you need to know in order to be praised or blamed. Mm. Uh, and the classic example I usually take to explain that distinction is if I pour uh, sugar in my wife's coffee, but it turns out that unbeknownst to me, the sugar had been replaced by poison, then I killed my wife in the action of pouring that powder in her coffee. And I did that freely because mm -hmm. I controlled my choices enough i was fully in control of what i was doing but i was missing some information that now excuses me because i'm not blameworthy for killing her i just didn't know so there are epistemic conditions you need to have knowledge of some relevant facts that if you don't know them you might be excused for what you're doing hmm. um, and free will is the control condition for moral responsibility hmm. okay that's that's really helpful so I, I think it'd be great to stick with the uh the coffee analogy so um, if you were manipulated by an evil scientist um, to to pour poison in your wife's uh, coffee, uh, then you presumably would not be morally responsible. 
Yes, that's the view I take. So the, uh, we, basically, when we consider manipulation arguments, we're going to have to uh, carefully ask what kind of manipulation are mm. we talking about. Uh, but when we speak of those classic cases of uh, mad scientists uh, usually using some sort of uh, brain electrode and yeah. dire directly causing a shift in our brain at the moment of choice, such that he controls, he determines the outcome of our choice by way of that kind of manipulation, then yes, uh, very much I take the view that this excludes our moral responsibility for that choice. Uh, and so when uh, that kind of story is used against determinism, uh, in order to say determinism itself would be excluding moral responsibility, it's really an argument by analogy. So mm -hmm. the, the way that you've just introduced the argument is one way of trying to use manipulation like that, but it's actually a little bit too bold because uh, the, the way that you phrased it is if determinism is true, then all choices are manipulated. So it's really a claim of entailment, right? So yeah. it's saying if determinism is true then it follows that the choices are manipulated uh, and here again whether how we assess that conditional is going to depend greatly on what we mean by manipulation yeah. but if, if what we mean by manipulation is some sort of uh, control in the way that you've described as the uh, mad scientist doing that then that conditional is going to be highly suspect because mm. just from the truth of determinism it doesn't follow that there is that kind of manipulation that's happening so the, the claim of direct entailment is very hard to actually take to the bank. And typically, uh, proponents of the manipulation argument are going to give a, a little bit of a different approach. And they're going to say it's an argument by analogy. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the way that argument by analogy works is that there's going to be that story of the mad scientist determining your uh, choice by use of uh, brain electrodes. And they're going to say, this story, we agree, rec uh, removes moral responsibility. And then you, as a Calvinist, you give a story of how God determines the outcome of all human free choices. Um, and the argument here is to say, there's uh, so there's, there's different ways of uh, cashing in the claim, but basically yeah. saying those two stories are very much similar. And mm -hmm. we're going to try to take the property of excluding moral responsibility that we agree is there when the mad scientist does it and try to slide it over to the normal case of determinism where God determines the outcome of an allegedly free choice and yeah. to say, well, no, that property transfers over and the exclusion of moral responsibility therefore must be affirmed also if it's God who determines the outcome of a free choice. That's yeah. typically the move, but it's a little bit different than just to say, if determinism is true, then uh, everything is manipulated especially yeah. if we don't even qualify the kind of determinism that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because uh, right now, obviously, you and I are very interested in theistic determinism, right? Yep. That uh, the Calvinist view where there's a God who determines the outcome of our choices. But if we just say, if determinism is true, that also includes uh, possibly natural determinism, right? So naturalistic mm -hmm. determinism. And on those views, it's very hard to see. So if, even even more so on those views, it's hard to see how, make, how our choices would be manipulated. Mm -hmm. I mean, manipulated by whom? Right. Uh, the, the mindless universes don't typically engage in manipulation. So right. um, the, the, the claim of direct entailment is, is not really sensi sensible. And uh, the, the smart incompatibilist who uses the manipulation argument is going to typically present it instead as a uh, argument by analogy like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's so helpful. And and uh, just to get clear for listeners who aren't as initiated uh, with with the topic, so um, Guillaume and I would would both say, uh, and and me because I read his book, right? Not uh, not putting myself on the same level, but we would say that uh, Calvinism uh, entails or just is theological determinism that God has preordained, predestined, uh, that God has sovereign control uh, in the strong sense uh, over everything that happens. So. Uh, meticulous providence. God exercises everything, every dust mite, everything that happens, happens because of the, the divine decree. And so when you transfer that theological term over into philosophy, it falls under the term determinism, that God has determined what happens. So uh, what Guillaume, Guillaume was getting at in being specific about what kind of determinism we're talking about, we would hold to a theological determinism, not just a brute uh, raw, you know, simplicator determinism because there are different types. There, you can be determined by the laws of physics. You can be determined by uh, an, an evil demon. You can be determined by all sorts of different things. There's not not very many people who are evil determinist, evil demon determinist today. But there, 
in philosophy. You never know. There could be someone out there. Um, but so, yeah, getting clear on these uh, different aspects is really important. And that's something that, that Guillaume does well. So I, I also wanted to bring up, um, so we, we said it's important to distinguish between, uh, distinguish the type of determinism you're talking about, but also you make a distinction between at least two different types of manip manipulation. And I thought that that might be interesting to, to talk about influencing manip manipulation and overriding manipulation. Is that, do you still have that fresh in your mind to, to kind of give a definition? Yeah, I, I, that's a clarification I, I provided in the book because uh, I started by when you assess claims that manipulation and uh, removes moral responsibility and that that can be used as an analogy to press the determinist on whether or not uh, his determinism exclude moral responsibility as well i wanted to be clear as to what kind of manipulation we're talking about so you we've already mentioned one classic view of a manipulation case that removes moral responsibility which is the mad scientist with his brain electrodes but um in ordinary life, we use the words manipulation for things that are a bit less nefarious than this, mm -hmm. or at least, I don't know if the uh, evil intent is there as much, but at least a little bit less covert. Uh, and it's not uh, it's not Im improper to speak of manipulation when it's not somebody who's using devices to trigger your brain, but simply somebody who engaged in some, some practices that would be seen as... Uh, let's say off limits uh not mm. fair play uh yeah. that that are intended to manipulate you into doing something uh but they're not really overriding your mental capacity they're just very strong deceptive tactics or influence uh like that and i try to gather all of that under the term of influencing manipulation mm. and here i i I didn't need to go super specific about what that looks like because ultimately I don't believe that these actually exclude your moral responsibility. So that so that in the end they they end up not being a very key player in that uh, debate. But uh, I, I think it was helpful to say okay there are two things we typically call manipulation. There's those practices which could be like emotional blackmail, you know, yeah. the deceitfulness, misinformation, try to manipulate a person to doing something like that mm -hmm. uh, or harassment, you know, just, just the subtle ways of you know, touching the, the person and getting them to do something uh, that they might not have done otherwise if we hadn't done those, uh, those various influencing improper influencing uh, techniques yeah uh, and so i i've put all of that in the umbrella of influencing manipulation and I, I do think there's a very significant difference between all of that and the cases where there's an outright bypass of your cognitive faculties where there's clearly a like a taking over the the mad scientist with his brain um electrodes uh, other ways of imagining this kind of overriding manipulation could be the use of uh, love potions right so okay. like you give you give a, a love potion there's a complete shift that happens uh, immediately in your uh, in, in your mind and then something mm -hmm. is forced upon you that uh, that you would not have not done uh, normally if uh, you mm -hmm. had not taken the potion uh, maybe hyp hypnosis might be yeah, in like that so mm -hmm. so again you you're not now uh, you, you're not acting from the outside maybe one way of classifying it would be outside or inside right so the influencing manipulation still kind of comes at you from the outside where uh, it's it's pushing you in directions you don't want to go um but it's still you're still using your own brain mechanisms your own thinking uh, to process all of this manipulation yeah. as opposed to the hypnosis or the brain scientist who clearly bypasses your cognitive faculties and just makes you do it uh, regardless yeah so I, I i've drawn those those differences between the two types of manipulation i think that's really helpful especially because we do use that term uh he he emotionally manipulated me. He, you know, yeah. and we use that in our everyday. So I think it's really yeah. important to to kind of parse that out. And so, um, and so, would you say that most of the uh, philosophical arguments, uh, manip manipulation arguments, are of the overriding manipulation brand? Uh, yes, I think that's the that's the ones that are offered uh, typically. Although th there's a bit of a slide. I mean, uh, if we come to d to discuss it a bit more in detail, uh, some of the versions of the uh, manipulation argument that I engage with, sometimes mm -hmm. there's a bit of a shift uh, between one and the other. So, okay. for example, I don't know if you want to dive into this yeah, please. already, yeah. but um, so the, the 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 very famous argument, uh, the man manipulation argument on offer in the literature is by Dirk Perryboom. It's called mm -hmm. the four case argument. 
and uh, it's called the four case because he basically tries to perform that slide I was mentioning from yeah. the from the uh, very bad manipulation to the normal case and trying to show that the exclusion of moral responsibility remains along that slide. And mm -hmm. it gives you four different progressive cases to do that slide. So it gives you a story uh, on, in which we are presumably um, committed to saying, yeah, that person is not morally responsible. And then he tweaks it a little bit and he says, well, we're still not morally responsible there, right? And then tweaks it again. And then just by mm -hmm. gradual shifts like this in four different cases, in the end, the last case is the normal determined case case that would be as free as it ever gets on uh, determinism and compatibilism. And he's saying, yeah, no, here, the, you've seen on that slide, we've still had no reason to remove moral responsibility. Yeah. So in that four case argument, I do think that there's a bit of a slide on some of the cases where mm. the description of the mechanisms that are used to perform that manipulation slide a bit between the overriding and the, uh, and the influencing types of manipulation. So it, it's a bit in there. But yeah. typically, yes, when we speak, when we think of arguments by um, manipulation arguments uh, by analogy it's going to be at least involving some sort of uh, overriding manipulation where it's clear cut that uh, that more responsibility is removed i'm not aware of any uh, hardcore calvinist who really says no yeah the, the brain scientist uh, changes your brain or the hypnotist uh, makes you something that you wouldn't have done otherwise um, or the the love potion uh, makes you fall in love in some with somebody that you would never have fallen in love with um, and yet you're still more irresponsible I, i'm not aware of that line being taken with that right. kind of manipulation yeah that'd be a, a hard bullet to bite there i, I like uh, paraboom's 4 case because it, it, it's a little bit um it brings in what what i've seen is like the uh the paradox of the heap or the sororities paradox where it's like you know find find the stopping point where you want to go oh no there's the uh, relevant uh difference there but it's it's like drawing a, uh, a distinction between uh, a couple grains of sand and a, a, a heap of sand. You know, where do you draw that line? And I think that's kind of the the brilliance of his four case is that your goal or your job is to find that relevant uh, difference where it switches over, and it's kind of hard to to find it again because he's he's making this sliding scale. And so uh, for the listeners again, if if it's wrong for a human to manipulate uh, Guillaume to you know kill me. If, it, if that's wrong for, for that manipulation to happen, then uh, the the proponent of the manipulation argument will then argue that um, the evil scientist that has manipulated Guillaume is, uh, sig uh, is similar, is analogous to divine determinism, regular determinism. For our case, it would be divine deter de determinism. God is just like that evil scientist because everything that we do is manipulated because he is determined it to, to come about. Does that, does that sound like a, a fair characterization? Yeah, yeah that's fine. And uh, j just to clarify that, uh, so what you said is true, um, that it's wrong for the mad scientist to do that to me. Uh, although the, the immediate concern of the manipulation argument is not really on whether this guy did anything wrong or evil or, or blameworthy. It's mm -hmm. more on whether what he did excuses me. Uh, yeah. Right? Okay. So, Good so point. the 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 question is, am I still morally responsible if the mad scientist yeah. does this to me, regardless of whether he broke any moral law in doing mm. that himself? So yeah. that uh, question of whether he did something wrong is actually yeah. um, also discussed in the literature, but it's for a sl slightly different kind of argument against divine determinism. And it's going to be the one, the, the other kind that I address in my book that says, now there's a problem with God if he does that. Yeah. Right. So uh, if God determines what I do, there, there might be some concerns and there is in the literature concerns about whether that excludes my moral responsibility. Yeah. And then there's concerns that now this makes God doing something wrong so that it involves him in, in inappropriately in evil. So these, these are the, the two different kinds of concerns. And when we speak of the manipulation arguments right now, our immediate concern was more on my moral responsibility if the mad scientist does this to me. Yeah. Oh, that's that's such a helpful clarification. Thanks for catching that. So so then if uh, God has determined everything to happen, then I can't be held responsible for what I do because it's been I'm basically being manipulated by by God. And then uh, what what's the uh, what would you call the other argument? I know it's in here. I'm just I'm blanking on what you would call the argument that that goes against uh, the, the God of Calvinism. Yeah, so this is the, the second part of my book. I, I don't know that I give a specific name for that 
part uh, as well. Well, yeah, I do raise the question, is God manipulating us? Uh, yeah. That's one of the different ways of unpacking God's involvement in evil on determinism. But there's a whole slew of, uh, there's a whole slew of um, claims that in that family of objection that say, if God determines us to do something wrong, that inappropriately involves him in evil. And, yeah. and, and there's all sorts of different ways all sorts of different inappropriate ways in which he can be involved by determining us. And so I, I tackle them in my book, but yeah. there's the concern that he might be causing evil or willing evil, uh, yeah. that he that we can say that he's permitting evil, uh, that we might say that he's responsible for evil. So all of those are a bit yeah. in that same neighborhood, uh, but they're more focused about God now than they are about the human being who's allegedly losing more responsibility. Yeah. Would, would, um, do you think that they could all be summed up in the charge of um, um, God being the author of evil, does that, uh, that's kind of how I hear all the time. That that makes God the author of evil then. Yeah, that's right. So uh, that's one way of unpacking this uh, objection. And uh, an important piece to say about the alle the allegation that God is the author of evil is that we're not super clear what that means, right? right, right. Uh, I mean, in what sense is he the author and in what way is that inappropriate? That's what yeah. you want to ask to somebody who uh, raises this objection is try to say, okay, let's try to pin down what does it mean to author evil? And uh, in that sense, why is that inappropriate for God right. to, to be the author of sin? So. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, in the literature, the, the a number of Calvinists, uh, I mean, Calvin himself, I believe, uh, denies that God is the yeah. author of sin. Um, yeah. And the, the reason he does that is because the phrase itself is typically understood to mean something very nefarious, that God is inappropriately the author of evil. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that Jonathan Edwards uh, gives a more balanced approach and he says, well, you ask me if he's the author of sin. I don't know. It depends what you mean by the phrase. If you mean something very nefarious, then I indeed, I agree that it would not be good for God, but I deny that he is the author in that sense. But if all you're saying is that he's causing everything that happens, you know, if he's determining everything that happens, then I affirm that God, God does that, but then I, I want to ask why is that, if that's what you call being the author of those things, I want to ask why is that bad for God to actually do that? And there, right. um, there's still plenty of room for the uh, non-Calvinist to give an answer to say, well, here is why that's a problem. But that's now going a little bit further in the argument, and we're not just stopping at a charge that he's the author of sin. We're yeah. finally clarifying what the problem is supposed to be, and we can engage it rationally. That's that's another uh, thing that I've benefited from your work and from the book um, uh, Calvinism and the Problem of Evil, where instead of just taking the the charge initially, because we uh, intuitively you kind of feel the force of it. Oh, oh no, I don't want to call God the author of sin, you know. But saying, well, well, what do we mean by that? Do we mean in a morally culpable way? Because I don't want to say that, of course not. But uh, if you mean, like you said, the distinction you just made, and so that's been very helpful in my own thought and work. I I want to get back to authoring evil type stuff in a, in a bit, but um, can we stick with um, with this first part with, with Dirk Paraboom, um, with, with these kind of uh, manipulation arguments to, to kind of draw out your answer? Because I like your answer a lot and I have a couple questions and I know uh, like like Timpy has some, some questions for you and I would love to just put those on display as well. Um, I have, um, I, I, I pulled a more, what you say, the uh, the rigorous syllogistic form Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I pulled uh, the one that's the uh, analogous uh, okay. argument, the, the an, an argument by analogy. So, so, so um, maybe maybe the the best we can do is, is I, I'll give you a sketch of what that looks like, uh, and great. then you can you can tell me if there's uh, something missing you want to discuss. Um, but yeah, when please. we when we press the manipulation argument in the form of the an argument by analogy, mm -hmm. um, there's really one of a couple of claims that we're making. And uh, in doing my work, I actually had to think a, a little bit about the the structure of an argument by analogy mm -hmm. because uh, the manipulation argument is not the only one that I treat in my book and several of them have the same structure of an argument by analogy and even though I had read a number of logic textbooks it's not going to that level of detail on how an argument by analogy works mm -hmm. and therefore what you must do when you respond to an argument by analogy how do you engage and refute correctly the argument if you disagree with its uh, contentions yeah. so 
uh, in my thinking, I've, I've realized that there's a, a couple of different ways that you can press an argument by analogy like this. As I said, the goal is in each case to give a, a story that is arguably analogous mm -hmm. to the normal case that you're trying to criticize. And then you're trying to see that some property of the one is carrying over to the other. And how that property is carrying over can be uh, pressed in two different ways. One is a fairly bold claim and the other one is a bit more mild. So the mild claim in an argument by analogy is to say that in the, uh, let's say in the manipulation case, mm -hmm. uh, there is a property that is relevantly analogous to uh, the normal case of undeterminism. So the, the, the claim can be made that between the normal case of God determining my free choice and the manipulation case of the mad scientist uh, using his brain electrodes, uh, the two are relevantly similar. That mm -hmm. is that there is a relevantly similar property. And what we're meaning by that is that in the case of the um, mad scientist using his electrodes, there must be a property that excludes moral responsibility and that same property must be present in the determinist case as well, yeah. in the normal case of determinism. So if that's the case, then you can see straightforwardly that that same property that excludes moral responsibility will equally exclude moral responsibility because it's also present on the normal case. Mm. So that, that's the mild claim. Uh, it's to claim that there is a relevant similarity. The problem with the mild claim is that uh, more often than not, we're not given what that relevant similarity is. Yeah, that is, we we are not told because in the end, really, an argument by analogy, and, and you know, I don't want to bad mouth arguments by analogy. They're <laughs> fine, and, and we need to engage with them. Sure. But really, the argument by analogy is kind of a a, a convoluted way of making an argument of. of I don't how do we say this. It, it's it's an argument that's really not about the analogous case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's trying to say there's something wrong, but it's not telling us what's wrong. It's simply giving us two different cases and saying, well, you know, they, they should be the same. Now tell me how they're different, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but really that's a, a somewhat subtle, even though I, I don't want to say nefarious, right? It's not like people right. offering uh, arguments by analogy are doing something wicked or, or anything right. like that. But, but it is a bit of a way of shifting the burden of proof because it's shifting from their claim that there is a relevant similarity to now a request for us to show that there's no that there is a relevant difference. Yeah. Right. And so this is the the, the mild and the bold uh, way of putting the argument. The mild way is the claim that there is a relevant similarity, except if you just leave it at that without telling us what that relevant similarity is, then it's still begging the question because the mm -hmm. Calvinist here is going to say, well, could, listen, I don't know what that relevant similarity is supposed to be. I don't think there is one, but if you don't tell me which one that is, I'm going to have a hard time refuting your claim. And then we're and just so, talking about intuitions at that point, right? You have this intuition that these two are, are very similar, and I could just say, well, I don't, I don't find that intuition, you know, valid, or I don't, it doesn't move me. Yeah, that might be, yeah. So there might be a conflict of intuition, uh, but mm -hmm. simply just, just to say, okay, you claim there is a relevant similarity, convince me of that, you know, yeah, tell me. Yeah. And so to convince me that there is a relevant similarity, the best way is to give me that alleged similarity, uh, and and it's usually not done, and because the a natural candidate for a relevant similarity is going to be something that's going to be so close to it's determined that it's still now begging the question because it's saying, well, it's the determinism that's the that's culprit here. Yeah. But if this, if it's the determinism that's the culprit, then we're begging the question of compatibilism. We're saying yeah. determinism excludes moral responsibility. Okay, well, then you can forget about the manipulation case. We didn't need this one after all. We can just say the yeah. determinism excludes moral responsibility, and that's all there is. Well, that, there's a there's a, a similarity I think between uh, in in theology there's univocal, equivocal, and analogical language. Uh, in not just in theology, but we talk about that all the time, and it's it's it seems interesting that the the same problems that people have with uh, analogous reasoning. I, I like analogy. I, I can get down with that stuff. But the problem that philosophers have with analogical thoughts or or uh, language is, well, there has to be some relevant kernel within there. There has to be some sort of univocity going on in the analogous reasoning in order for me to understand a connection. So God loves and his love is analogous to my love. But if there's not a relevant uh, similarity, a kernel uh, that that is in there, then what are we even talking? Then we're just equivocating. Mm -hmm. And if there is the same kernel, then we seem to be trapped back in univocity. 
And so I, I think that's a great point that you're drawing out. And that's why um, arguments by analogy can be kind of like this, this vague, uh, fuzzy thing. Just I'm just going to push this at you, and now you show me that it's not. The yes, case. exactly. And so, so to to exactly uh, do a slow motion replay on that move, right? On the mm. on the push here, you yeah. can see it, it's really between the difference between that mild claim that there is a relevant similarity, mm -hmm. and what now is uh, the bolder claim. And the bolder claim is there is no relevant difference. Okay. So the the there is a relevant simula similarity is claiming that whatever is in man the manipulation case is also present in the uh, normal determinist case and thereby refutes uh, removes removes more responsibility. The bold claim says there is no relevant difference. That means that there is no property on your normal determinist case that. Um, uh, there, there's no, sorry, there is no property of the manipulation argument that removes more responsibility and is not present yes. on the determinist case. That would be a relevant uh, difference. And, and that so, pushes the, the burden of proof towards back back on us then, right? So you're, you exactly. prove that there is a relevant difference. Exactly. So it can be that move a little bit to say, now you show me that there's a relevant difference. Um, I, I don't think it's a, an invalid shifting of the burden of proof okay. uh, because it's usually more posed as a, as a question uh, or mm. simply as an additional premise in the argument. They're going to say, well, there is no relevant difference. I claim it. Mm. Uh, and if there if that's true that there is no relevant difference, then we can both agree that clearly that means that there should not be more responsibility in the normal case. If right. there is no relevant difference, then th what's true of the one should be true of the other with respect to more responsibility. Mm. But it's now bold. And, and in terms of responding to the argument, identifying those two different claims is helpful because now it shows you exactly what can be done by the responder. Uh, yeah. If the claim is simply there is a relevant similarity, the response must be, well, tell me what that similarity is or I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if what you're telling me is the relevant similarity is the simply the fact of being determined, um, then that's begging the question because I disagree that being determined removes more responsibility. So that's the normal response to the uh, uh, mild claim that there is a relevant similarity. But now when we turn to the uh, bold claim uh, that there are no relevant differences, um, the double response must be given that it's one, it's still question begging uh, because what, no, you know, the incompatibilist is saying there is no relevant difference. Okay, yeah. well, perhaps I disagree. Um, good luck proving that there is no relevant difference. Well, how, yeah. how, how would you prove that, that there is no relevant difference? You're looking at all the properties and saying, well, uh, it's not the case that any property that removes more responsibility on the case of manipulation is absent from the normal case from determinism. And it's, it's very hard to prove as an incompatibilist claim. It's so a really bold claim. Yeah. It, it is bold. It is bold. It's hard to prove. So uh, we could theoretically leave this still as a standoff to say, well, you claim that there is no relevant difference. I disagree. And I have not been shown that I'm wrong. Yeah. And so technically, the argument could end there. So we could uh, ask them back back up that premise. Then. Exactly. So simply yeah. to convince me, give me additional premises, give me additional arguments to convince me that there are no relevant differences between the mad scientist and the normal case of determinism. Yeah. That that's that could be there. But now the benefit with that bolder claim is that we can now actually go on the offensive mm -hmm. because now it's a claim that there is no relevant difference. So what we can do to prove it wrong, right? To not just leave it as a um, question begging claim, right? So to to mm -hmm. simply say it's not been proven, we can actually go on the offensive and say no, that premise now, that one we can actually prove wrong, and all we need to do for that is to provide exactly what they're asking a relevant difference. Yeah. So a relevant difference is going to be a property of the manipulation case with the math scientist that in that case excludes more responsibility and is absent from the normal cases on determinism. So yeah. if, we, if we were to find one of those, then we go beyond the claim that they're just being a question, and we provide a rebutting defeater for that contention, which is that uh, now we are showing them that there is, in fact, a relevant difference when they're claiming there is no relevant difference. Yeah. 
And so uh, that's so great. So instead of letting their argument stand and saying, look, you haven't proved this, good, you know, better luck, go back to the lab, and then you can come and, and prove it to me. We're saying, no, I'm, I'm refuting it. I'm, I'm yes. showing you that there is a relevant difference. I'm giving you a counter argument, a counter example. And since it's so bold, it all hinges on this on this one premise. If I can show that premise is wrong, then your whole argument falls. Yes, that's right. And, and, and I think it's desirable. Right? I mean, it's, uh, as a general truth, when you're doing philosophy, um, there's going to be exchanges of arguments like this. Uh, yeah. Technically, you could you could be satisfied in just pointing out which premises of your opponent you uh, do not accept. Right? Yeah. You say, well, I don't accept this premise. That means that your argument doesn't really bring me to the conclusion. OK. We're not, you know, I haven't lost. I haven't lost. But <laughs> if, if all you're doing is simply uh, voicing your skepticism about the premises of your opponent, at some point it can start to look a bit suspicious and you can uh, be accused of an unreasonable skepticism. Right? Yeah. Uh, so whenever possible, you want to do more than just saying, here's the premise I don't accept. You, If you're able to show why you don't accept it by showing that you actually have a positive argument against it, then it's more powerful. And so in the case of the manipulation argument and, and a number of other arguments by analogy, I try to do this once I've analyzed the structure. The mild claim is question begin because we're not told what is the alleged relevant similarity. And if we and if our opponents want to provide something else, then that's fine. We'll discuss that one. And yeah. it won't it won't be about manipulation anymore. It's going to be about that new thing that they've actually highlighted. So yeah. that's the correct answer for the um, uh, for the mild claim that there is a relevant similarity. And when they take the step, the next step and they bring it to the bold claim that there are no relevant differences, then here we have the twofold response of saying, yes, it's still question begging because I disagree about there being relevant differences. And even if I didn't know what the relevant difference is, it could still be there, right? So uh, yeah. you, need to, you need to prove that there are no relevant differences. Even if I don't know what is the relevant difference, it could still be there. And but in fact, I try to identify some of those, some uh, relevant differences, uh, so that I can do more than claim that you're begging the question, and I can actually show you your claim is refuted by yeah. those counterexamples. And this is where I come in with my criterion of God-givenness, yes. uh, character, and desires. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so be before we get to that, I'm I'm so excited to get to that. But before we get to that, you you had mentioned that you hadn't seen a lot of uh, work done on. Uh, arguments by analogy. And so is is your bold and mild claim, is that original to you? Is that something you had to create or were you able to find that somewhere? You don't have to set your sources or anything like that. But No, no, th this is something I had to really uh, figure out on my own. Now, mind you, I might have uh, just uh, restated something that's stated sure. elsewhere and I haven't read it. Uh, yeah. I don't claim to have read uh, all the logic textbooks uh, that, that people have, right. have come across, but I haven't really found this very careful, rigorous analysis of arguments by analogy. So I had to kind of figure it out. And, yeah, and it, well, that's and so awesome. But it, it it seems right to me, right? That that this is the move that is being made here. So yeah, well, it, it's it's that's really impressive for one. But but two, it's really helpful in arguing and in debating to have these kind of tools to help yourself and help uh, you establish the burden of proof. Because you, you can you can bring these tools back, and when someone's arguing by analogy, first you have to you have to recognize that. And if it's in Twitter or if it's in Facebook or whatever, like recognizing what kind of argument are they making? And look, it, it shouldn't probably be just to uh, to drag people on Twitter, but maybe my, my wife is making an argument by analogy about doing dishes or something. And I want to help her out. I don't want to just stomp her down, but okay, she's making an argument by analogy and it's a mild one. And so I need to, you know, and, and so to, to, for the sake of the conversation, I need to to help us with that. I, mean, I might not say the burden of proof is on you. You have to do the dishes. But it, it actually helps in our everyday lives if we're able to think clearly. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna bring it back. And we'll see. Maybe I'll uh, I'll be sleeping on the couch, but maybe not. Yeah, I think that my experience is uh, that this kind of tool is great for the philosophy books. And uh, if I'm gonna be speaking with my wife, uh, she she won't necessarily enjoy that. And I better do the dishes instead. That that, that pays off better. Uh, uh -huh. uh, philosophy is the love of wisdom, so I'm gonna leave you that uh, tidbit of wisdom, uh, my brother. <laughs> that is wise. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> preempting some stuff there. So let's let's continue on into your God given. Uh, your God-givenness principle. 
Yes, so the, this is what I try to uh, to offer as that uh, rebutting the fear, right, mm -hmm. uh, to the claim that there are no relevant differences between manipulation cases and the normal determinist case. Um, it's it's definitely a difficult one, so I, I don't want to say that the manipulation argument is extremely weak or anything like that. I think that right. this is this is one of the really strong shots that the incompatibilists are taking at uh, compatibilism. Um, and the reason I, I respect that argument more is because there are similar arguments that are offered on the basis of other things that remove moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I treat them in my book. Uh, so typically yep. the, the claims that we're pets or puppets, uh, if we're determined, uh, the claims that we are coerced, right? the yep. coercion argument is a, an important one. Uh, and in each of those, it's usually really easy. So they have the same structure again. So you can give the exact same responses to the mild claim that it's question begging. And then mm -hmm. the bold claim is uh, still question begging, but then we can refute it. And that refutation in the other cases is almost trivial because it's very easy to see uh, exactly what they're asking, namely a relevant difference. Mm -hmm. You look at the case where, manip where um, a moral responsibility is excluded, so in the case of coercion, and you can see some properties that obviously remove moral responsibility there yeah. and are not present in the normal cases. So in the case of coercion, there's the use of force or threats. Right. That's what is really part of the coercion and the force or threat uh, physical force or threats need not be present in the normal cases so yeah. it's it's fairly easy to identify that property that is the relevant difference mm -hmm. and that that now refutes the claim that there are no relevant differences uh, that's what i'm trying to do as well for the manipulation argument but i do want to say it, it's not super easy to find what is that property that's present in the case of the mad scientist determining the outcome of my choice with this improper mechanism is using and what's the difference between that and the case where god determines the outcome of my choice and it's yeah. still it's still more irresponsible and um so again i, I reflected on this uh and it seems to me right to think that what really makes the difference is the who's doing the action of determining the outcome yeah. of my choice and that god um is the proper source for my character and desires uh, to be expressed in the choice that now makes me more irresponsible, as opposed to the mad scientist who is bypassing my God-given character and desires. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, so this is just for the little story, it's clearly not in the book, um, but uh, th that, that understanding um, came to me from of, of all places. Um, do, well, uh, do you know who who uh, tipped me off to this idea? Like, who is the uh, great thinker of this world who has influenced me into thinking that? Uh, it might. So it might be a switch up here. It might be like Richard Swinburne or something like that. No, it is Joe Biden. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> the context is so strange, but this is how it happened. Uh, mm. it, it was in a documentary on uh, steroids called uh, Bigger, Stronger, Faster. I don't know yeah. if you have seen this. Sure, it's, sure. It's, it's pretty funny. It's a very interesting, thought provoking documentary on the use of steroids. And at some point, they were showing some of the Senate hearings uh, that, were, that were taking place uh, when they were deciding on whether they should ban the use of uh, steroids. Uh, so just make it illegal. Yeah. And there was this small segment by Joe Biden where he's all emotional and trying to make a, a very impassioned case. Uh, and he's saying, uh, I was in sports and struggling and I couldn't understand why I couldn't beat these guys. And that's because these guys were using steroids. Mm. And, and he used that little phrase and he said they were using steroids instead of their god-given capacities uh, like I, I was uh, doing it. Wow. And, and, and it struck me that, um, there, so clearly this was not a deep philosophical thought by uh, philosopher <laughs> Joe, Joe Biden, uh, but it struck me that um, this uh, question of uh, the use of steroids in sports had a little bit of the same taste um, that uh, as the problem that I was trying to resolve with the manipulation argument. And it's trying, it's identifying something that on the surface can be seen as a bit arbitrary. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you're thinking of the sports, um, the, the sportsman activity, right? Uh, there, there's a, a challenge, there's a game, right? There's a game of sports or there's mm -hmm. a, 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 an athletic uh, performance uh, a feat that is being accomplished. So it's either jumping very high or running very mm -hmm. fast or doing something very ex exceptional. Um, and ultimately that feat is going to be done by having the proper muscles and technique and so on. Um, but 
there are several ways of having uh, those muscles in place that are going to allow you to perform that activity. And it's the same muscles, it's the same state of affairs that leads to the success, but there's one that's proper and the other one that's improper. Yeah. Right. And so trying to identify the, the what is not arbitrary between the two, like why is one improper and the other proper, uh, it seemed to me was successfully done by that little small description that Joe Biden was using, that in one case you have the God-given physical capacities that are appropriately uh, praised in the, uh, in, in the accomplishment of the physical performance. And on the other, you have the use of a syringe with uh, steroids that are, not, that are somewhat bypassing or cheating, that are not the God-given uh, uh, capacities to the, the, the person. And the same strange arbitrariness is there as well um, when they discuss the, uh, the performances of the cyclists. I think that they are in interviewing, it's not Lance Armstrong, uh, the other American cyclist who's been somewhat accused of doping, uh, and he was saying, I, I didn't dope, I was using a, a, um, a high pressure uh, chamber, so he was sleeping in, a, in, a, in an altitude yeah. chamber, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, doc the documentary, very interestingly, was saying, okay, um, Basically, that boosts your uh, blood counts, or I forget yeah. the, the biology something. exactly. So it, it does something <laughs> very specific to your blood that um, is going to help you tremendously during the race. And they were saying there are four different ways of doing that. Uh, you could um, sleep in an altitude chamber. You could practice up high, high up on the mountains. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the, just the ra rarefied air is going to do that. Um, there's another one that I forgot. And then there is just blood doping. Right. And they're saying they're all doing the same con uh, the same effect on your blood. The same thing is being achieved, but some of them are legal and some of us, one of them is, is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. the, the doping is wrong. And so there's a, a surface uh, level arbitrariness that is hard to go beyond. Yeah. And, and, and once again, it seemed to me like a good way of removing that arbitrariness was to say, look, there are, there's a, a God-given capacity that is measured in a uh, legitimate sport uh, that you bypass by using the steroids. Yeah. And in, in the same sense, I try to apply that little phrase, uh, it seemed to me correct, to think that when the um, mad scientist is controlling my brain by using his electrodes, he's bypassing something that's uh, essential to me, that's my true self. So the, these are the, a couple of phrases that are used by some philosophers of free will to talk about a more irresponsible choice. They say that they must express your true self. Mm. Or, uh, Fisher and Raviza talk about mechanism ownership, right? I, it mm. has to be something that's authentically me that's expressed in the choice and the mad scientist is not authentically me yeah. but then my my understanding was that uh, what's an authentically me is to a great extent determined by my creator and so yeah. he's the one that's the appropriate source of who i am uh, in this business of making choices and therefore the fact that he has wired me in a way that I'm going to respond also to his, uh, so it's the general makeup that God has given me, but also responding to his immediate promptings on the moment of choice, right? So as Christians, we are convinced that God influences greatly um, his human beings on the moment of choice. So the fact that all of that in the hands of God would preserve my moral responsibility um, seemed to me to not be arbitrary, even if I deny that I am morally responsible when the math scientist does that. So this is the criterion that I try to offer in response to the bold claim of the manipulation argument uh, by saying there is a relevant difference. Not only if I didn't know it, um, I, it wouldn't follow that there is no relevant difference. So you, you would still be begging the question. Yeah. But, but here's my attempt to actually go on the offensive why don't you consider that criterion? I think that is that is exactly what they were asking for. That is a property, so the, the bypass of one's God-given character and desires, right? That mm -hmm. property, I think, is uncontroversially present in the case of the manipulation by the scientist, sufficient to remove moral responsibility. Yeah. Right? I, I don't think that that part is controversial either, because I right. think the, even the incompatibilist would say, yeah, if you bypass my God-given character and desires, that's got to remove my moral responsibility. Right. And 
it's not present in the normal cases on determinism because God is not bypassing your God-given characters and desire. He's the appropriate, legitimate source of your God-given character and desire, yeah. right? Self-evidently, yeah. God is the source of what's God-given. So those three things that are uncontroversially true about God-given characters and desires are... I think satisfying the demand of the bold claim that says there is no no relevant difference. I beg to differ. What I just offered to you seems to me to be a demonstrably a relevant difference. Yeah. So there is you're establishing that there is this this asymmetry between God and a and a human manipulator because uh, God is rightfully the one who establishes our character and our desires through uh, this through his determining action through the parents he's given us right through all of our, our actions. So it's not like he, uh, I don't know how, how much you go into the story of it, but, um, well, we, we may not need to go into that, but, um, he doesn't just put these, uh, thoughts and beliefs or, uh, make us act on actions that aren't compatible with the rest of our God-given character, that, right? That's right, yeah. So I, I think there's an organic uh, hole into yeah. how he makes us. And, and and arguably, I mean, it could be that uh, if he decides to somehow jump us, jump wire us uh, yeah. at some point uh, in, in ways that are very similar to what the mad scientist is doing now, right? So that there's a huge disconnect between my general makeup as he has made me and what he's doing on the moment of the choice, such that he could actually remove moral responsibility in that sense, right? So so yeah. we don't need to see any anything that God does as being God-given and therefore uh, preserving yeah. more pr preserving Great moral point. responsibility. Um, mm. So, so it's, it could be possible there. But what I'm saying is that that in the normal cases where the compatibility is going to say, yeah, I'm determined, but I am still morally responsible, then God has simply this continuity. Uh, and so the fact that he determines the outcome doesn't uh, is, is not relevantly similar to the mad scientist. Yeah, yeah that's great. Initially, uh, just I think of Saul uh, on, on the road to Damascus and uh, and he gets hit by, you know, however he gets hit and uh, becomes he becomes Paul. He sees Jesus and he changes and you might say, well, yeah, he's he's changing his God-given character. It's completely out of step. And you go, okay, well, then Paul's not uh, morally responsible for that action. But that's fine because we don't want Paul to be morally responsible for his own conversion anyways. Yeah. So, 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 so uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know how I think about that. So, uh, yeah, yeah you, you could uh, read that, that uh, scenario like that and say, yeah, he's, he's so radically changing his character mm -hmm. that he's uh, removing his moral responsibility. Uh, I don't know if I want to take that reading. Um, yeah. I, I do believe God has ways to naturally change our makeup even very significantly sure. uh, without necessarily uh, removing the moral responsibility that's in there. I mean, uh, when I think of my own conversion, uh, I mean, I was an atheist for much of my young adult life, and then I had a fairly radical conversion as well. There is a great deal of my in, inner makeup that was changed by the discovery of the gospel and accepting that forgiveness in Christ. Um, that change of heart and shade of mind that happened fairly quickly, I see in retrospect, obviously, as the work of God in my mm -hmm. heart. Uh, and it was something that was so seemingly foreign at the time, right? So yeah, I, right. I, I, was, I was bent on not liking God and somehow he changed my heart. Um, but... I'm a new creation in that sense, right? So Second Corinthians five, right? we're, we're we're really transformed. And we're new. Uh, the the old man has gone, and the new is here. Uh, but I I would like to say that the new man is morally responsible as well. It's just sure. that God has made a new creation in you, and it's still a properly God given new character and desire, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so, so perhaps I, I don't know how to read that jump uh, in the conversion, and perhaps in the case of Paul, perhaps in my case uh, there there is a jump, and then you'll find saying, well, you're not praiseworthy for your uh, change of mind. Yeah. Um, I know that some uh, some philosophers take that view that uh, that we are determined and not morally responsible for our coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I'm open, I guess. I, I don't I don't see a strong reason to deny moral responsibility. Yeah. So we're, it's not like we're saying, oh yeah, I I now I'm praiseworthy because I'm saved and I I, I did it. I'm so great. That's right. not really the that's not really the message. We're talking about just the mild uh, change to say I receive salvation by faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's still a good thing to do 
but it's not one that will get you a ton of praise because it's not like you're somehow living perfectly. Uh, it's simply the, the switch and, and the placing right. your trace in your faith yeah. in Jesus. But, but in any case, but, yes, sorry, yeah. uh, perhaps a, a helpful um, yeah. detail to add is that when I think of... Um, that difference between the mad scientist manipulation and the the normal case where God determines our choices, and since He's the uh, proper source of our God-given characters and desires, the natural response or the the, the possible worry that the incompatibilist is going to have is uh, it's a bit arbitrary, right? Just to say, well, um, the, the your answer boils down to God did it, right? So so mm. uh, the, the the man does it, it's wrong, and then God does it, and now it's uh, some somehow it's fine. Yeah. Um, and to answer and try to um, assuage a little bit that worry, I would say that it's in the continuity of a number of things that we properly say is improper for a man to do, but that if God does it, it's fine because he's in a radically different position than we are. Mm -hmm. And I think one key example in that respect is the taking of a life. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if I if I decide to kill you, that's murder. If God decides to take your life right this moment, uh, he's perfectly fine to do that. And the Bible tells us in plain as the day that he does this, right? He right. life and he brings down two Sheol. So um, that, that type of asymmetry between God and man is helpful in understanding why it's the case that if a mad scientist manipulates me into doing something like that, he, he removes my responsibility and he himself does something wrong. But if God determines my, the outcome of my choices, he is in a very different position. He's yeah. the proper ruler and creator of the universe. My creator, who, has, who is the proper source of my character and desires, and he has the prerogative to do that in such a way that if you were doing that to, to me, that would be manipulation. But, uh, yeah. but God well, can do that. I, I think that's very important. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, yeah, just like you said, the, the asymmetry that, that is needed in order to uh, to refute that argument, isn't gained uh, nefariously. It's not. It's not arbitrary. It's not uh, ad hoc or post hoc. Whatever. Um, it it comes right from the theology that we're defending already. It comes from the creator creature distinction. The the asymmetry is because of the ontology of the of the matter that there's this uncreated God who creates us. And yeah, there's a huge asymmetry. And just bringing that theology to play in the argument turns out to be the exact thing that you need. Yeah, I really like that. So, so that has to do again, uh, like you, like you helped me, uh, reminded me earlier. This manipulation argument has to do with moral responsibility. So, mm -hmm. if your if your God givenness character, uh, if that moral principle is effective, then we've defeated this manipulation argument against theological determinism, meaning that God can determine me, and I can still be held responsible for my moral actions, maybe my beliefs, other things uh, that 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 I can be held responsible for. Anything I can be held responsible for, I can be held for on theological determinism. But then the initial, uh, immediately you think, well, then that makes something wrong with God. That broaches the uh, the author of, of sin kind of argument because then uh, he's determining all the bad stuff. So he's giving me a bad character. Is yeah. that Does that seem fair? Does that, does that pop up to you the way it, it does to me? Yes, that's uh, that's absolutely right, and it's in a sense. I mean, that's the double burden of my book. Right? It's called "Excusing Sinners and Blaming God," which are the two uh, main arguments that I'm trying to refute there. Uh, at least families of arguments, and they're very connected in the way that you try to link them. Here, we see that the worry initially is that if God determines what we do, we cannot be blamed for the wrong things that we do. Uh, and the immediate corollary is that if we can't be blamed for it, it's because God should be blamed for it. He's right. the one who made us do it. So that the, the shift goes from man to God very quickly in those. So yes, it, it's a very natural shift to, to operate in, in that sense. Yeah. So so um, I, I want to get to the author of Sin, um, but something really, really uh, on my mind lately has been the epistemic or epistemic uh, defeat uh, argument. So so um, this argument kind of goes, uh, William and Craig has made this argument, uh, others have made this argument, that if, uh, if, your, if your beliefs are determined by God, and they kind of take this from the, there's, a, 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 there's very many very good arguments against uh, naturalistic determinism and epistemology that 
if you were determined by the laws of nature to believe something, that's not a good reason to believe it. And so you actually aren't justified and you're believing it. And so then they take that uh, and they, they put that against uh, Calvinists. And they say, look, if God determined you to believe this, then it's actually not your belief. It's God's belief. And then where, where I go with that is if you have a wicked belief, then really that wickedness, any kind of uh, a, a tri- attribution of belief, blame for having that kind of thought or belief actually goes to God who ordained that you have this, who gave you this God-given character to have these kind of thoughts or um, to, to act. We can go back to actions if you want, but um, immediately what you said. So now we're blaming, we're blaming God. So um, if we could maybe stick real quick with the, with the epistemic uh, problem, because I know you have an answer for that. Uh, how do you, how do you answer that one? Yeah, there's a number of things that uh, that can be said. Uh, the immediate one is to, again, try to not allow the shift of the burden of proof and try to dig in a little bit. What's the claim, really? Yeah. Uh, the claim is a conditional that says that if God determines what we uh, do and what, you know, if, if God, if determinism is true, God determines all things and all those things include our choices and they are also including our beliefs, right? So what yeah. we ultimately come to believe. So there's no hiding this. The theological determinist is saying that God determines everything and right. everything includes what we believe. So mm-hmm. um, the the claim of the argument is that if God determines what we uh, believe, then uh, we cannot be justified in holding those beliefs. Um, yeah. And it, it, it can be this generic or sometimes, uh, I mean, I know that I've, I've interacted recently with Tim Stratton who was uh, organ, um, offered this argument. Uh, and I think that he restricts it to uh, drawing of inferences. So it's mm. not necessarily all knowledge that, that is excluded if determinism is true, but at least the drawing of rational inferences. So yeah. w- whichever cases you apply it to, the big idea is this, that if determinism is true, then you can't have that kind of knowledge. You can't tr- uh, trust your cognitive faculties or you, you, you can't be warranted in believing what you believe there. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's fine to state it like this but once mm-hmm. you do it's obvious that the calvinist is going to disagree with that conditional right so it's, mm-hmm. it's that part of the arguments that is going to be said no uh, i maintain both that we are determined and i maintain that i have knowledge so yeah. uh, this is where the disagreement is but there's not much of an argument that has been given at that point right so if, if, if you all you're stating is the conditional if determinism is if determinism is true then you cannot be warranted then there's not much of a debate. So, so what we want to do from there is to probe and say, what are some of the reasons you have for thinking that determinism excludes my being warranted? And what I found here, uh, so I, I don't typically get a very clear answer as to what the worry really is. Mm-hmm. And there's a collection of different uh, ways that they can try to say, here is why. Uh, and um, one of them might be, uh, that in the neighborhood of that uh, worry is the uh, naturalistic arguments against evolution that uh, the evolutionary argument against naturalism that uh, Plantinga has offered. Mm-hmm. So uh, Plantinga has uh, argued against naturalistic determinism um, by saying that uh, if there is no God or anything like God and your cognitive faculties are just a result of evolution operating on, you know, on um, natural selection, then you can have good. Re- you can uh, think. We, we can think that our cognitive faculties are reliable to make us survive, but yeah. they they were not. The the mechanism of our cognitive faculties was not a uh, following a design plan aimed at truth, right. more at survival, and that's a defeater uh, for the belief that our cognitive faculties are reliable to give us truth. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a helpful and a funny argument uh, that I enjoy. Uh, yeah, it undercuts the belief in determinism. Exactly, uh, yeah, right. in, in naturalistic determinism. Right. And so I think that that argument is a little bit there. Uh, and and it's a worry that uh, the universe, you know, the laws of nature are not rational. So that uh, mm-hmm. if we're determined by them to believe what we believe, then we're, we're not really aiming at truth and we should believe that we should distrust our cognitive faculties in that sense. I affirm this argument, but we can see clearly that the key part here is not uh, the determinism of the process. It's the problem that it's not aimed at truth. So it's the target of where where our cognitive faculties are aiming. And in the case of theistic determinism, our cognitive faculties are created by God, right? And they are Mm -hmm. aimed aimed at truth. 
So um, the fact that uh, the universe, a uh, mindless universe, uh, does not care about truth, right? Does not uh, f shape us towards the truth. That it's not a rational process that makes us should not worry us if we think that we've been made by God, who is rational, who has the intentionality of us forming mostly true beliefs about the world, and has geared our brains to be like that. So I, I found that distinction helpful to see. Yeah. Okay, I see the claim by planting guy in the neighborhood, but that one doesn't work against uh, theistic determinism and yeah. maybe this is what's causing you to think that theistic determinism excludes knowledge another way of uh explaining why it's not a worry is to try to see uh th think of the uh the immediate insertion of a an action in our mind by the mad scientist right mm -hmm. uh Similarly, I think Tim Stratton is uh, eager to use that kind of uh, mechanism to say, now, if the mad scientist is making you believe something, then you should not trust it. Um, and, and here what we can see is that a direct implantation of a belief like this that bypasses yes. our normal cognitive faculties, we can agree would not be warranted, right? Mm -hmm. If all you're doing is just the insertion, like, hey, here's this belief, and it's disconnected from the normal good mechanism that um, collect the information and rationally uh, allow you to conclude that something is true, uh, then yes, that insertion should not be warranted. And so you, right. you have a reason to distrust it. Um, but in the normal case of God's, uh, of, our, of our using our God-given cognitive faculties on determinism, but theistic determinism, the mechanism that collects the information is not like that preemptively uh, just just arbitrarily inserted in your brain it's actually tracking what i take to be evidence right so it's yeah. tracking truth um and one uh helpful way of describing that mechanism is um in the same way that fisher and raviza describe our decision making uh mechanism mm -hmm. on determinism when we are more responsible they talk of uh, reasons responsiveness yep. i don't yeah. know if you, you okay so sure. you've read that so um they're saying that we are determined to do what we do but it's not such that we do that regardless of the reasons that are facing us we are doing so in such a way that we would have done otherwise if some reasons had been different. Yeah. Right. So there's that counterfactual that is true at the same time that we choose X. We're also saying I would not have chosen X if some reason that influenced me had been different. Right. So that we are responsive to reason. So our, our mechanism of decision making on the Fisher and Raviza's view is reasons responsive. And I think we can affirm the same thing of our cognitive faculties on the theistic determinism, that, that we believe X, but we would not have believed X if some reasons had been different. Yeah. And this is very intuitive. And I think this is helpful because that's the kind of connection that you want to have between your beliefs and the evidence. You want to have an evidence that shapes your belief, right? That it's based on it. Mm -hmm. And in such a way that your mechanism, your brain, your cognitive faculties could have been able to track the truth if the truth had been other than it is. Yeah. So you want to have a cognitive faculty that is reasons responsive, that actually tracks with the truth, and that makes it reliable. And, and uh, interestingly enough, it's now uh, when when you consider that kind of response to reason, and you see, well, that's what it takes for, for us to have a fully rational uh, cognitive faculty, is that it's capable to track reasons. Uh, when you look at that kind of uh, mechanism, you aren't able to go on the offensive with the uh, indeterminist who is, alleged, who is alleging that what you need is to be able to choose uh, right. to, to choose to believe otherwise, right? So you need to, to, to be able to freely believe otherwise, even if the evidence, all the facts about yourself and all the things that are facing you remain in place, right? Yeah. It's a categorical ability to choose otherwise or, or to, to believe otherwise in the case of, of the epistemic self-defeat. So uh, I think that this is much less reasonable because you're saying that the evidence being just as it is you want to be able to say, no, I don't believe it right. without changing anything. So it, it seems much more reasonable to say, no, I'm determined to follow the evidence where it leads here. Uh, and if the evidence had been different, then I would have chosen differently. So yeah. I'm, I'm reasons responsive. Yeah, and I, I think that actually uh, mirrors the 
uh, categorical versus like uh, conditional analysis of uh, principle of alternate possibilities. And you just take that right over into uh, epistemology. And yeah. I, I thought, so I, I talked with uh, Dr. Greg Welty uh, via email about this, and he sent me a quote that he found from R Richard Swinburne making this point. And he said, it's kind of funny, you know, thinking Richard Swinburne was making this argument against... Uh, uh, against the objection itself, yes. So Richard right. Swinburne is himself a incompatibilist so he, yeah. he he has every reason to want to de to refute determinism <laughs> right. there but he says no this argument doesn't work because yeah, yeah uh, swinburne says your beliefs should be molded by the evidence right right which which uh that's that's so great because you in affirming the strong sense of libertarian free will especially uh if it's not source libertarian but but uh leeway or you know uh, committed to path you are overplaying your hand because you want this ability to like this doxastic voluntarism that you should be able to choose whatever your beliefs are. And, and the, the pushback that you just made is so, so great because no, you should not uh, choose against the evidence, against the reasons. Like you, you, you're, you want your beliefs to be molded by the evidence. That's, That's a right. good thing. Yeah. And, and, and so, you want your you want your belief to be reasons responsive. So it's yes. responding to reasons changing, as yeah. opposed to on the other view where your belief is responsive to nothingness. Yeah, <laughs> that is that I, I respond by changing my belief in response to nothing changing. Yeah, right. So oh. I think it's far far better to see our beliefs as being reasons responsive rather than to be arbitrarily picking one or the other, regardless yeah. of a change in the reasons. Yeah, I, I love that that argument. One thing that that kind of uh, uh, picks at me in the back of my head. I'm not really pulling it from anyone. Just kind of uh, when I when I think of this argument myself, it seems like. I, I hope you you can help me with this. It seems like uh, so so God has determined that uh, yeah God's determined that we use reason and logic and the normal uh, our cognitive faculties and uh, in in the position that we're in so that we would come to the, form the belief that is uh, warranted for us to to hold there and sometimes we hold sometimes we come to beliefs that are unwarranted or unjustified however you analyze knowledge um, but God is still sovereign over that aspect too. So that's where I get a little bit hung up in in that God has also ordained my faulty reasoning. That's right. And so, so what do we do with that? You know, am I to blame? So now we get back to the God uh, excusing sinners or, or blaming God. Mm -hmm. Should, am I to be excused for for having that faulty belief because um, I have been uh, predetermined to to hold that belief? Or, or is God responsible for giving me that bad belief? What, what do we do so, with that? Yeah, so so one, one thing to clarify here, you used the language of excuse uh, mm -hmm. for holding a wrong belief. Uh, yeah. This might be mixing epistemic and moral categories yeah. a little bit uh, sure. because holding beliefs doesn't have to be morally significant, right? So you yeah. can have a mistaken belief without it being blameworthy. Sure. So I, I don't know that you need to be excused necessarily when you hold a wrong belief. You know, okay. like if I'm mistaken about something that's somewhat innocent, you know, morally neutral, like, uh, I mean, uh, let's say, so I, I had a baby girl born uh, three, three, four weeks ago now. Uh, and uh, let's Great. say, uh, let, let, let's say you ask me uh, quickly in the, in the interview, hey, uh, how many days ago was she born? And I tell you, well, it was uh, 28 days and it's turned out it's actually 27, right? So I, I, I didn't think well, I didn't uh, accurately describe the truth, but I, I don't think that I need to be excused for some, yeah. doing something morally wrong here. I just have a you know, mistaken uh, answer so um, we don't necessarily talk about an excuse here um, in terms of removing our moral responsibility. Now, when we think of God being sovereign and in our view, determining all that happens, that does include our wrong beliefs as well, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what we're asking is not, uh, does the fact that he does that, does that somehow nullify our praiseworthiness or blameworthiness for our beliefs? Then in that case, we're not really... Like it's the more general question of what we choose to do, right? So uh, it's it's if if we're talking about praiseworthiness and blameworthiness, we're talking about moral responsibility. Yeah. Um, and it's not um, so it's not going to be significantly different just because we're talking about uh, wrongly believing. Hmm. Uh, if if we now talk about beliefs that are morally significant, right? So if, yeah, if yeah. I'm holding a belief that's morally reprehensible, uh, I'm still morally responsible if compatibilism is true with respect to moral responsibility. Yeah. Um, but but when we think of beliefs, and uh, I think the, the, the worry that you might have is, is it 
like why is god doing that really you're asking or he's determining that i have that i hold a false belief uh and and here i think that we're going to have to turn to regular theodicies and mm. uh, discussions of the problem of evil really yeah uh, what what's the benefit of having me believe something that is false if we take my believing something false as something that's less than good right so uh, it's it's, <laughs> it's bad i don't know if it raises necessarily to the heights of evil but it, it's not good for me to have a false belief and all it means is that god must have a morally sufficient yeah. reason for that to happen yeah. uh, and here you fall straight into the discussions of the problem of evil and uh, various debates as to whether or not i should know those reasons if god has those reasons mm -hmm. uh, the discussions of skeptical theism all of that sort of thing but really it's it, you've you've just uh, uh, pole vaulted into a yeah. very standard debate on the problem of evil uh, it just used that question of my false belief as as a very specific case of a state of affair that is maybe not evil, but at least less than good, and yeah. asking why would a perfect God bring about a state of affairs that's like that? Um, yeah, so. well, that that's so helpful. I'm so glad that you you definitely helped me think through that. Yeah, so so even if it was like uh, if I had beliefs that were morally uh, egregious, you know, uh, beliefs about uh, Nazis and stuff like yeah. that, right? And so maybe ones that that would be you shouldn't have that belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then we we move back into the realm of theodicy and defense against evil, and we can go with skeptical theism if, if that's our if that's our jam there. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. Yeah, that that really uh, genuinely helps me think through some stuff i'm working on right now so i really appreciate yeah. that yeah right. my pleasure um it, it that brings us if you, if you have just a couple more minutes uh mm -hmm. in into evil i know it's a, a huge topic to cover in a couple mm -hmm. minutes but um we've already kind of broached a little bit here um so just going back to the the condition uh that, that you brought up about uh, god givenness so mm -hmm. when it comes to when it comes to uh my sin it seems a little bit weird at first to say um, well, why did you sin? Or, so on compatibilism, um, especially, would you consider yourself a source compatibilist? Well, I'm, I'm not you sure make that, that distinction. Well, I, I do. I'm familiar with the language of sourcehood, but usually it's more on the incompatibilist side that we're going to say that uh, somebody is a source compatibilist or source incompatibilist. Yeah. So uh, to say of somebody that he's a source compatibilist uh, is simply a way of saying that he's a compatibilist, I think. Uh, that's what so, I. That's or, or what I maybe, think too. Or maybe help me understand what you meant by source yeah. compatibilist, and yeah. I'll tell you if I believe that. But sure, uh, sure. typically, the, when we speak of sourcehood, it's because the incompatibilists are going to be divided as to whether or not uh, they are pressing for alternate possibilities, or simply that you would be the ultimate source of your action. Both yeah. of which allegedly require indeterminism. But on the compatibilist side, uh, I deny that uh, moral responsibility requires either, right? So yeah. I don't think that you need the categorical ability to do otherwise in order to right. be morally responsible. And I don't believe that you need to be the ultimate source of your choice in the way that they understand it, right. in a way that excludes my being determined by God. So right. I deny both of those requirements for moral responsibility, which makes me a compatibilist. Yeah. And I don't know that I would qualify it by saying a source compatibilist or leeway compatibilist. In which case, I just believe that determinism is compatible with moral responsibility. Yeah, that's helpful. So that was the distinction I was thinking of. In uh, I just read Dirk Perboom uh, and Michael McKenna, I believe, their, their uh, Routledge book on free will. And, and they went through the historical, uh, you know, initially compatibilists what wanted to hold uh, uh, a compatibilist had had wanted to hold on to PAP still, and mm -hmm. so they were they were leeway compatibilists, and then there's these source compatibilists, and so uh, that that's that's a helpful point that you're saying. You know, I'm I'm a. I guess you, we would say we're theological compatibilists. Yes, and much of the confusion or the talking past each other here really boils down to the, a failure to dis, to uh, remove the ambiguity and the kind of ability that we're talking about. And yeah. I think this is a, a lot of the heavy lifting in my book is done by cl clarifying that right. there are two kinds of ability. There's a conditional ability to do otherwise and a categorical ability to do otherwise. And a compatibilist should affirm that you do need the conditional ability to do otherwise in order to be more irresponsible. Responsible. So That's in that sense, I, I maintain a principle of alternate possibility. Yeah, PAP or, if, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. It's principle of alternate possibilities understood conditionally. Those are more are necessary for more responsibility. I think it's clear that if, if I can't do otherwise, even if I wanted to, then I should not be blamed for what I'm doing. 
Hmm. So, so that that principle of alternate possibility, I affirm as a compatibilist, but it's a milder version of the principle of alternate possibility. Hmm. And I must, as a compatibilist, deny the categorical uh, the principle of alternate possibility that says that in order to be more irresponsible, you need the categorical ability to do otherwise. This one requires indeterminism. Right. So once you've clarified those two senses, seeing that the compatibilist must affirm one and deny the other, then you. It, it goes a long way in, in understanding why some compatibilists want to hold on to a, P, a, a PAP, like you, you said, you know, like do they want to hold on to a principle of identity possibility? The, more often than not, it's probably that, that they want yeah. that uh, conditional sense, and therefore they're saying, yes, you need the ability to do otherwise, yeah. and uh, they must deny the categorical sense. And you find the same confusion about the so-called uh, moral maxim of the ought implies can. Yeah. Right? So uh, m many times uh, the the same worry about more about determinism and more responsibility is phrased by using the phrase that if you ought to do something, then you can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the can is again this ability that is ambiguous between cat categorical or conditional ability. And uh, so so if you use the maxim ought implies can, or if you use the principle of alternate possibility that says uh, more responsibility requires the ability to do otherwise. In both of those, you really need to clarify which sense of ability or which sense of can do you have in mind, and then tell us whether you accept it or not. Yeah, uh, because otherwise it, it's complicated. So, so some people say I affirm the principle of alternate possibility. So some compatibilists say I affirm the principle of alternate possibility, but I deny the maxim of that ought implies can. Mm -hmm. uh, or some say, well, I deny both or I affirm both. Uh, and usually it's simply the disagreements are simply because in one sense you understand can differently than yeah. you do in, in another. So. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's really helpful. So when I first, uh, so I read your book when it first came out and then I started studying a little bit more in philosophy, uh, in, in the philosophy of free will. And I remember your, your, uh, conditional pep if, and I used it on all of my libertarian friends and it was very fun. And mm -hmm. then, uh, I kind of let go of any kind of sense of pep cause I'm like, fine, I don't need it. Uh, it's not worth the debate for me. And now you're bringing back to my mind that, oh yeah, dang it. So I have to go back and, it's not as easy to fit in these little tight spots where I'm saying, no, I'm, I'm not a leeway compatibilist. I'm a source compatibilist. And, and just saying I'm a theological compatibilist and let's define our terms. Let's define what I mean by that. And that the, the necessity for a conditional PAP is interesting for me. And we don't, we don't really have time. Maybe we could do this again and you could help, help me understand that more. And I could read your book again. Um, I, I do like PAP if I, I really do like that. And I've, I've used it on my, my philosopher friends. Yeah. Um, it's very fun, especially because uh, it, they're not as familiar with it, which is, which is great um, <laughs> for me. Yeah. But um, yeah, so, so I, I do really appreciate that help. And, and I'm a little frustrated cause I got to go back and I got to <laughs> bone up on this stuff again. <laughs> I'm but, really uh, sorry to cost this amount of pen, but <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. So um Okay, when it comes to to blameworthiness, um, let's talk about Satan. So Satan uh, fell. Adam fell because Satan uh, tempted him. I, I don't really have a problem with that. That makes sense. As long as there's an evil uh, corrupter around, it makes sense that 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 corrupter could could corrupt Adam and uh, you know help shape his. Uh, desires, even though that's over uh, under the sovereignty of God, God used the secondary means of this evil agent in order to bring about this evil belief in Adam and Eve, and then they acted on that evil belief. That's fine. When it when it comes to Satan, um, I know we want to be very careful. We don't want to speak where the Scripture doesn't speak, and so you know, feel free to just throw that out. But God, Satan has this God given character of being like the father of lies. Mm -hmm. well, what do we do with that? Yeah, so what do we do with this? Uh, it's kind of an open-ended question. Um, <laughs> Sorry, guess, uh, I'm pushing the burden of proof to you, and you can feel uh, free to push well, it back. Well, it's not even a burden of proof. It's a, it's a question of, like, do you have something interesting to say, Which what, whatever that is? Right. Uh, there's not much of an argument or a question on this. What, what do we make of this? Yeah. Um, let, let me think of some of the possible worries or, qu or interesting things to say about that. Um, I think it'd be initially it'd be like the author of sin, right? So, so we 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 rightfully say Satan's the father of lies, and we we rightfully, as reformed folks, we want to say Satan uh, is the author of sin. 
but yet yeah. God is the author of creation. And like a, a good Ed, Edwardsian, we want to say, well, no, if, if you mean that authoring sin means he made the one who made sin, sure, okay. Yeah. But, but so, so yeah. I think that perhaps one, uh, one piece that is difficult to swallow is the idea that God would give uh, sinful yeah. inclinations. Yes, to the God givenness condition. Right. That, that, that God would uh, make a, give us a makeup that is uh, fundamentally has sinful inclinations. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can see why that's. Uh, that's, I'm not worried that, for that me. Might be a, that might be a struggle, but yeah. but 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 what I want to say to try to help you is on the yeah. contrary to try to to look at uh, us, right? So um, theologically speaking, as Christians, we we are going to be affirming something like that. Why are we sinful? We mm -hmm. we are sinful because we are fallen sinners. Uh, we right. are descendant of Adam, yeah. so there's something that we've inherited from right. him. Sure. Um, I don't think it's plausible to think that it's an inheritance that's purely mechanical in the sense that it's somehow in the DNA or in the, in the seeds. Uh, I, I don't sure. think that is a very uh, plausible option. So uh, you want to ask yourself, what kind of connection do I have with Adam that makes me a sinner? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's kind of a of a um, it, it's like he sinned, mm -hmm. he um, and as a result of his uh, sinfulness, I today I'm inclined to sin as well, right? Right. So um, when we think of that connection uh, occasioned by original sin, uh, there's a helpful con uh, distinction that uh, is done is between original guilt and original inclination. Right. So right. In a very robust, very reformed view of uh, original sin, there are two things that we say uh, happened with the uh, the fall of Adam: is that uh, his moral guilt is in some way uh, credited to us, so that mm -hmm. we have some somewhat of a moral. Uh, uh, ledger that's negative, uh, negatively impacted because of what he has done. So there's kind of an imputation of sin. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there's this idea that now I also have desires, inclinations that are going to lead me to to sin of my own. Right? Yeah, so corruption. Just, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so the original guilt is, I think, the more controversial one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not really the one we're talking about right now. What, what we're discussing is uh, how, what is the source of my inclination to do wrong things? Right. Uh, and I think that as it's carried out between Adam and us, I think it has to be operated by God, right? So as, as Christian, I think we, we would say that it's a legal, uh, it's a legal pronouncement, right? It's, it's kind of a judgment that, that yeah. this results from that. Uh, and the world doesn't really um, enjoy this idea that there's somehow this legal right. uh, ramification. But between Christians, I don't think that this part should be too controversial. Sure. But there is a, a legal um, uh, consequence uh, that is worked out by God, right? God is the creator and he's the maker that is going to give us this inclination. So I, I, that uh, helps me understand that God giving us some um, uh, inclination, some desires that are not uh, morally right uh, is a legal, it's a, so it's unobjectionable in the sense that it's a legal condemnation, right? So it's just doing just like, uh, you know, if God just uh, kills someone as a retribution for sin, it's it's a it's a bad thing that is uh, that is happening and it's operated by God, but it's righteous in the sense that he's right. just in doing that. Right. I think that in some of the same ways we can see our getting a sinful nature as a result of Adam fall to be operated like that by God yeah. um, and in such a way that we uh, now find ourselves in with counterfactuals that are negative right? so that if we were to be placed in certain circumstances we would sin uh, and they are, these uh, in, sinful inclinations are coming from our sinful nature that we've inherited from Adam yeah right now uh, when, when we think of Adam uh, as well it, it's interesting that um we so let let think of let let's think of it as a conversation between Calvinists and Molinists, right? Uh, sure. The Molinists are going to be the libertarian incompatibilists that are still committed to saying that there are those counterfactuals about human beings, that mm -hmm. uh, there is such a thing as what I would freely do in any circumstances that are not in fact actualized. Um, and, and when we think of Adam's sin, right? So uh, Adam. The, 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 the mystery gets compounded when you go back to Adam because right. uh, for, as for me, why did I sin?
sin is uh, somewhat attributed to saying, well, I was born as a sinner. And right, makes that's sense. a consequence of original sin. So I was such that I had that original inclination that is a sinful inclination and that was just expressed in the situation with respect to adam uh, the theologically christians are going to be saying that he was not a sinner until that fateful decision was made um, but you still want to ask well why did he make that decision you know it was a sinful decision it was a wrong decision so it, it gets dicey how philosophers of free will are going to be speaking of inclinations, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, acrasia, uh, and so we could bring so, in some so, weird words. So, so, um, so, so the compatibilists are going to be more naturally speaking of having an inclination that is now expressed. I think that uh, the libertarian Thomas Flint uh, has written that it gets pretty tricky how a libertarian should speak of inclination mm -hmm. because you know inclination sounds like you're being inclined, and then the choice is just flowing out of this when they, on the contrary, want to speak of some somewhat of a disconnect between your current state of heart and the ultimate choice you make, there, there's got to be a possibility that it's, you know, it's not being just tipped over. You need it's some, still, yeah, indeterminism. It be, exactly. <laughs> so so, so the, uh, an account of inclination is difficult on a libertarian account, but for the Molinist, when you unpack the uh, the choice of Adam to sin, uh, they are still committed to saying that there are counterfactuals about what he would freely do in any set of circumstances. Yeah. And so the, let's look at the set of circumstances in which he was placed to commit that first choice. The Molinist, at least, must affirm exactly like the Calvinist that Adam was such that he would sin if placed in that circumstance. Right. And that God so, knew it because he has middle knowledge, and and, and, that, yeah. and that he knew it. But but the the fact that uh, that that counterfactual is true, that he would sin, and the way we know that that counterfactual was true is that he did sin. So if he did sin, then it's the case that he would sin in those sure. circumstances. Yeah. Um. And so in 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 that sense, uh, the, there's that counterfactual that was there that we don't have a very uncontroversial explanation on how he got that inclination. Right. 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 Uh, yeah. So the, the, and there might be plenty of disagreement between Calvinists and non-Calvinists about that, but it's still the case that you have a, an inclination to sin that's there. Uh, and as Calvinists, we say that God determines all things. Now, mind you, it's still an open possibility, and I, uh, I think that some Calvinists might take that uh, view to say that there was a fundamentally different understanding of free will before the fall. Right. So yeah. it, it's a, it's seen as a non-arbitrary difference. Uh, the prior to fall and after the fall yeah. so that uh, maybe there might have been some indeterminacy or some uh, some different kind of free will for adam before that that the fall and then afterwards yes we're all yeah. determined we're all uh, um, you know bond in bondage yeah. to sin and, and the world can, bank. yeah you could dress it up with some pre-lapsarian post-lapsarian language and it, it sounds much it, better it, exactly so so you you can try to have a bit of a difference there um but as a theological determinist uh and I personally affirm that God determines all things, and that mm -hmm. include that includes Adam's sin as well. Right. So I, I, I am committed to saying that his inclination was ultimately determined by God. Yeah. Obviously, in terms of rescuing God's goodness in the face of all of that, you take the whole theodicy conversation to yep. skeptical theism, and God had morally sufficient reasons, and um, all of that. Uh, to discuss God's goodness. But I, I do think that uh, God determines that inclination. He has good reasons for doing so. And he does so in a way that preserves our moral responsibility. Yeah. That's, that's the most I can make of, of that account huh. there. But yeah. and, and then uh, once that fall has taken place, I, I see my sinful inclinations as still God-given in the same way, as still preserving my moral responsibility and not implicating God in a way that makes him evil because right. whatever he's put in there and however amounts of grace he gives me to over, to overcome my original inclination um, is uh, serving his good purposes and glorifying himself in all things. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I totally agree. And I think your book did such a good job. You did such a good job in your book of showing that that whole argument you just laid out and why, you know, we're morally responsible. God is not uh, morally culpable for our actions. Those two fit together perfectly well. That's awesome. And and to me, again, with uh, inheriting corruption, all that sounds good. Once we have any kind of sin in the line, it, it all totally falls in place for makes sense. And yes, uh, morally sufficient reason. And I think that more, more at the end of the day, the morally sufficient reason is God glorifying himself. 
Um, but I don't know how this particular evil serves that purpose. And that's where I go with skeptical theism. That's right. Yeah. But, but so when it comes to the uh, God given his principle, you're, you're saying that that's for us, right? So maybe does that not apply or, or should we remain silent on whether that God given his principle applies to Satan? Because he's like the, the first sin. And I think that's the one that I have a lot of trouble with because everything else totally makes sense to me. And it's okay if, if everything doesn't make sense. That's all right. You know, I don't have to know everything. And maybe it's not given to me to know. Um, but have you have you considered that like Satan's God-givenness as the first sin? Well, I I don't see a relevant difference between yeah, okay. uh, Satan's situation and, and yes. Adam's really. Um, so perhaps one question is going to be when you look at Adam's sin and you, the way you phrase it is that he sinned because Satan kind of did something to him uh yeah the, the you want to ask well, what is it that that satan allegedly did to adam was this uh the outside temptation opportunity with the you know again the influencing manipulation you know like, yeah, you know, like right, has, sure. has, has god really said and oh sure. look that fruit really tastes good so all of that is still from the outside and allegedly it does not control the uh inside uh inclination of adam right in influencing uh, manipulation right right Exactly, yeah. but it's still coming from the outside, right? In mm -hmm. such a way that if you think that Jesus had been in the place of Adam, right? So now you have uh, Jesus, who is an impeccable person, who is in, uh, impossible. It's impossible for him to sin because he's yeah. so morally righteous that there is nothing in him to be tempted by anything, right? Yeah. Ima right. Imagine this had been the case, uh, then I think he would have resisted the temptation because yeah. uh, the the temptation came from the outside. So the fact that Adam failed that test still reveals that there was something on the inside of him that was inclined to wrongdoing you know that uh, the to follow that outside influence. Ex ex exactly yeah. and so that deficiency on the inside of adam you know one must be at one must be committing to saying that at least god permitted this to be there uh, sure. yeah. this is the most neutral language i use on the calvinism he, he put it there i think so mm. um, so um, that possibility like, to fall, yeah, yeah. Well, and in the case to, of Calvinism, like the, the certainty that he will, that sure, he yeah, plan, plan that. So, right. um, the, the 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 working inside of us of our inclination towards sin must be seen as a determined uh, piece as well. Uh, yeah, and, and I don't know that the libertarian incompatibilist has much easier of a way in explaining those sorts of things because even if the choice to sin is not determined, there's still this. Uh, fallibility right there's still this uh inclination yeah. to sin there's still this infamous counterfactual of freedom of adam in the circumstances of the fall that adam in sub for in for some reason was such that he would sin if placed in those circumstances and right. that is that is a moral failure to be such that you would sin in those circumstances yeah and and yet god's world contains that so in, yeah. in some sense we want to say uh, with the molinist with the calvinist that god has good reasons or reasons right. for why he made the world like that yeah so uh last thing i promise so um with with i think a, a relevant difference between adam and satan might be that with uh, adam i totally affirm what you said about uh, the the conditional uh, you know ability to sin and given that he was placed here and that God determined it there's something in Adam that was allowed to fall and he had this external source uh, goading him towards that or manipulating however you want to say yeah. it so then when we push it back to Satan it seems like the only other person around is God mm -hmm. and so um, yes he can have that internal thing just like just like Adam did, and he must have because he did, right? That's like the we go with the Molinist answer there. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, so he must have because he did, and so then it's the question. And uh, again, the Bible's silent on it, so I should probably be silent. But whether it was <laughs> God, like Calvin to me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I've read my Calvin. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm I'm so nervous of speculating here. But if God created him, with his God givenness was originally bad, which seems like I don't want to say that. Or he was created good, which which doesn't mean perfect because he fell, so we know he's not perfect. But mm -hmm. who was the tempter on that side? And and I also don't want to say God was the tempter either. 
Yeah, no, I I don't know that there was a temptation or a tempter. I, I don't know exactly how it would have happened. Yeah. Uh, like you said, the Bible is fully silent on that. Sure. Uh, I think that even some of the texts that are typically um, brought in as allegedly talking about the fall of the of the devil are right. most likely not, at least not primarily about the devil. Yeah. Uh, so being stretched, the, yeah, we stretched. Yeah, it exactly. Far. I think it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, uh, where it's talking about uh, actual Old Testament human beings, and then the language is taken to be, oh, here, here it is. That must be the devil, and it seems it seems like a stretch to me. At right. most, it would be a fuller language, right, a double meaning of some sort. Uh, but I, I don't see those. So, in the absence of information about what the devil. Um, origin story is uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't want to speculate on yeah. on white kind what what i can affirm with a good degree of confidence given my theological understanding is that um, whatever happened there was in god in god's good providence that yeah. he uh, determined all things uh, for his ultimate glory and that uh, the devil seems to be a moral agent so that there yeah. must be some sort of a compatibilist account there again of god determining the devil to be like that uh and yet him being blameworthy for the way that he yeah. behaves uh all ultimately serving god's good purposes yeah yeah I, I i like that answer so we we do know the why because of 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 you know god's control and god's morally sufficient reason we right. just don't know the how and i, I think c.s lewis says sometimes people just fall off their bike like they, they, there's not really a, a, a and i know it's kind of a cop out i kind of like it it's kind of aimed at the how we know the why and we can affirm that god's right. goodness is over well, it all well, i think the struggle here is that we know the general right right so we, we know the yeah. why in general that is for god's glory he's got good reasons but we very rarely if ever know the uh, specific why yeah you know, like you said like why this time i fell off my bike we were in that instance what good did that serve mm. uh the, <laughs> i i don't know those things but yes right. i know the general why that uh yeah. in the grand scheme of things this is what god has created yeah. and he, he thought this was a good way to glorify himself and and, yeah. and all those things that happened we can trust and that's one of the practical aspects on which i close my book that there is a hel helpful um confidence that in all of our suffering god has good specific reasons yeah and i think it's uh, it's a pastorally helpful even in the face of tremendous suffering to know right. that god has meaning in that Amen. and that it, and that it's really just to preserve the free will of the people who've hurt us right yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah <that's true. laughs> which ultimately can, can can be that right so uh, or the hurricane that that destroyed our home right yes, there's no free yes. will going on there yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so even though we don't know the mechanism of the how of how satan fell off his bike mm -hmm. we do know the 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 grand why and we don't know all the the uh smaller whys thank Gu guillaume thanks so much for all your time man i we went way over but i really appreciate it and it was very helpful for me personally and i know it's gonna be helpful for my audience too um so one more time i want to plug this book you guys go get this book excusing sinners and blaming god a calvinist assessment of determinism moral responsibility and divine involvement in evil guillaume Bignon is uh he's he's the man he's really helped shape my thought and he's been so generous with our time uh, with his time. Thanks so much, brother. This has been huge. You're very kind. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, this has been Parker's uh, Pensies, or uh, can I get you one more time to say it? <laughs> Pensies. <Pensy. laughs> yes, Boom. All Parker, right. Parker's Pensies. Yes, I might uh, use that again. Um, uh, as always, all glory 